Hello, I'm Natalie Becker. Welcome to It's Africa's Time. In today's episode, we travel in South Africa to meet two major players, Adcock Ingram and Procter & Gamble, to learn about their inclusive business strategies and commitments to sustainable development on the continent. But before that, we chat to UNDP's Thomas Salez about the concept of an inclusive business ecosystem, how it applies to business, and the impact it could have on Africa's sustainable growth and development. That there's this concept of public private partnerships. In the context of Africa, you actually need an additional P. It has to be public, private and people's partnerships. The MDGs cannot be implemented without the role and participation of business. It is critical to have business because business creates the jobs, they create the incoming opportunities, they create the technologies, they innovate. So they essentially they are part of the, the change that we need. First and foremost, we need to support the existing business that prove that. We need to take out the information related to how they worked, what are the opportunities, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, secondly, as it is called by our report, the Diamond, we need to look into incentives. In order to get the private sector involved and in promoting, we need to put out the incentives in terms of, you know, creating the regulatory frameworks that entice, that create opportunities for the private sector to get involved. We need also to directly government when they can support the development of micro business, SMEs, family owned business. Now, if you want to support business, you know the critical element is investment. Without investment, you can have, you know, plants, manufacturing uh, and other activities. So it's important to have the investment there on the part of the private sector as well as in the government, some catalytic investment. Finally, you know, if you want to empower people, this, uh, poor people, you have to give opportunities so they can have access in terms of the training, the, 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 you know, the capacity. So the combination of these four elements of information, incentives, uh, in investment as well as implementation support, those ones will lead to more uh, inclusive business. We have three hubs on regional hubs on the continent and our main activities follow what we have in South Africa. Prescription pharmaceuticals, over-the-counter pharmaceuticals and our hospital or critical care products, drips, in injections, water for injections. We want to be part of the clear growth that Africa will experience over the next 10 years. We're particularly interested in growing in Nigeria because you can't win in Africa without winning in Nigeria, 180 million people. So we have ambitious plans. And what has changed on the continent is increased political stability, which has brought increased economic stability and a growth of the consuming middle class. Consequently, more and more people are getting into the um, formal medicine franchise. We're also seeing a lot more health awareness um, coming into onto the continent and therefore your vitamins, minerals and supplements are beginning to pick up. So the non um, sort of uh, prescriptive medication, health and well-being products. Uh, we're also seeing an increase in what we call middle class diseases, hypertension, diabetes, uh, obesity, things like that. But we're also seeing um, an increase in smaller pack formats to address the affordability uh, issues on the continent. So instead of packs of 20s, you're getting packs of 2s. Uh, instead of 100 mil cough mixture, 5 mil sachets and the like. Um, distribution is also becoming a game changer for any pharmaceutical company. I was working at Edcock Ingram, a Wakefield branch, as a tablet technician. I've worked for 19 years for the company. Edcock's strategy is to own his own distribution direct to customer. Uh, currently, we're servicing 50% of our volume through the wholesale channel, and 50% we're doing direct to our, our customer. 
The owner driver scheme objectives is in three parts. It's for our drivers to empower them to own their own businesses. The other part of the objective was to provide a better service to our customers. The third part is for our stakeholders and our shareholders. By investing in the owner driver scheme over the 16 million rand in, in the scheme to still maintain the enterprise development points um, that's giving us the level 3 uh, BE score at this stage. The other benefit, huge benefit for us on, on the scheme is obviously cost. Um, in the past we've outsourced the, the, the part of the business the owner drivers are currently doing to courier companies which rates was extremely high which makes it a more sustainable solution going forward. And that's why we will carry on investing in this owner driver scheme. Uh, Elcock did uh, purchase the car for us because I was not going to uh, qualify as a person to, to get a loan of 1.2 million or 1.5 million to purchase this, those cars. After we've paid the car in the five years that we have the agreement on it, so the car belongs to us. I've learned how to run a business now, unlike before, as a worker. Adcock Ingram has provided the owner drivers with training courses on standard operation procedures in terms of delivery, anti-hijacking and vehicle management. They've also received business training from the firm appointed to manage their newly founded companies. We've got 12 uh, PTYs um, set up. In each PTY there is a director or owner and he's, he's got a driver, additional driver, and two van assistants. So in that PTY, we've got four employees. We've got 25 vehicles. We've got three sites running on it. We've got Cape Town, uh, we've got Bloemfontein, and we've got um, this facility in, in Midrand. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in the selection of, of the owner driver, the director, um, to make sure that they can make the next step from a driver into a, um, a business owner. We've had a lot of dealings with Mishak through the negotiations and, and we're really proud of him as the individual managing his company um, in the best manner. In the first day when we were notified that we, we will be the owner driver that were shortlisted, I couldn't wait to start when to start my business. It's a huge big difference from uh, being a worker and becoming a and an owner of your own business financially has improved a lot and it was a big step for us. The lucky one that was selected, I mean out of 87 applicants, we are very fortunate to get this opportunity. The vehicles uh, range from one tonnes to 50 tonnes. We also spend a lot of time on the design of the, of the uh, bodies, insulated vehicles, temperature controlled, um, also with tail lifts, the necessary uh, security tracking systems on it. The, the, the owner drivers are very proud of their vehicles and you can really see they're looking after them. If you over revving your car it will tell you, the speed it will tell you, the idling it will tell you. I mean, you can't go wrong with this car. We get uh, so much support from the company and so much support from the management. The relationship is fantastic. Our aim is to have a, a bigger number of uh, vehicles within the company to make sure the delivery is been rendered within the time that is, uh, is required. I'll continue with my business because this is the business I love, this is the business I like. And the more you like something, it's the more you learn more. I'm enjoying it. Adgar Ingram's um, tagline is adding value to life. So we like to invest in um, CSI initiatives that are community-based and fundamentally change people's lives. Operation Smile um, deals with cleft, uh, rectifying cleft palates. Um, children born with cleft palates in most cases on the continent are shunned, ostracized, and in the extreme could be killed. So for a very small 
minor operation, you can change people's lives. And we can't see a better way to add value to the lives of our consuming public. They have a very similar footprint to at Cork Ingram on the continent, so it made sense to actually support them pan-African uh, rather than just in individual countries. The stigma associated with cleft lips and palates throughout Africa, obviously in Malawi, largely are associated with beliefs around witchcraft, around children being evil, and that, that cleft lips are, are a condition that can cause curses towards other people and so that children are dangerous to their community. They're socially isolated and they're often badly abused both verbally and physically. But the challenges are much bigger than that. Children with cleft lips and, and palates suffer malnutrition, they suffer ear infections and many children without treatment also go deaf as a result of lack of surgery. Over the last 30 years, Operation Smile has offered over 200,000 free procedures, and in Malawi we're reaching 400 after only two missions. One of the first starting points of a mission is obviously awareness raising and sensitization. The clefts are treatable, because obviously without families knowing that, patients don't come. We run posters, we run radio campaigns, and we have a, a pre-registration system. Patients are then bused from 26 provinces to the Kumutu Central Hospital in Lilongwe, where we accommodate up to 400 patients for the process of screening. On a large mission such as the mission in Malawi, we run six operating tables, so that's six operating theatre teams with plastic surgeons, anaesthetists, recovery nurses, clinical coordinators, and everybody associated with the surgery. But we also bring dentists, speech therapists, child life specialists, paediatricians, intensivists, recovery room nurses, and obviously ward nurses, day nurses, night nurses, and everybody else associated with making sure that children have safe surgery. So a full team is in the region of about 60 people. But obviously, most of us don't speak to Chewa, so we work with up to 60 local volunteers, particularly nursing students and medical students, who are looking to, to train, obviously, to be able to do these procedures in the future. And children are often not able to go to school or gain employment without speech therapy. We bring speech therapists with us on missions, but also on our 6, 12 and 18 months post-operative assessments to give speech therapy and counselling to families. So we rely on corporate and obviously the public for our support. And organisations like Adcock Ingram that provide not just financial support, but obviously product are a wonderful partner to have. Africa's time travels to Falvata in South Africa's Limpopo province to visit a primary and a secondary school, both of which have benefited from PNG's outreach campaign for girls. When we did some research, we realized that almost a third of girls who reach puberty either stay at home when they get their periods and sometimes they even drop out of school completely. And we decided as a brand that this is something that we want to address. So in South Africa we're in, in 74 schools at the moment um, and in South Africa as well as Kenya we are aiming to reach 10,000 girls every year. The objectives of always keeping girls in school is to educate young girls who are in rural or previously disadvantaged communities and schools with puberty education to give them the bigger reason to stay in school and to offer them uh, sanitary towels to help them when they are on their periods. We work with professional nurses who would run the puberty education classes. The second element, I'll classify it under motivation or giving the, the learners the bigger reason to stay in school. We do it in different ways. The first one, is identifying prominent young women, South Africans. We take them to different provinces or schools and they will then interact with the girls or tell their own stories of how they dealt with the puberty phase. The last one, partnering with the provincial departments, we identify bright young girls who have been enrolled into the program to help facilitate entrance into uh, tertiary uh, education.
the literacy levels of the parents is too low. So it's, there is a big gap between a person who is an academic and a person who has never gone to school. The majority of the women are domestic workers and the, the men are actually working in the farms. So the majority of them are actually depending again on their social grants. The challenges are that they indulge a lot in alcohol and drugs and arranged marriages for small children and their participation in the education of their children, even puberty education, is zero. We are having approximately 713 learners in the school. It's a poor rural community with a lot of social problems. One of the big challenges for us is uh, many of our learners are staying without any parental uh, guidance or supervision, very often taking care of younger brothers and sisters. Sometimes the, the parents are working in another town and the learners are staying with an aunt or an uncle uh, or they are staying completely on their own. School girls getting pregnant is, is a, a real challenge to us um, and it's a very unfortunate situation. A learner uh, may only attend school up till seven months of pregnancy after which they must uh, then leave the school uh, until they are declared medically fit and then they can resume their studies at the school. The local clinic in Falwater is addressing the girls on pregnancy issue. We also have a local NGO, Waterberg Welfare Society, um, that is focusing on HIV AIDS prevention. One of the misbeliefs that affect understanding of menstruation uh, in girls is that uh, your period is your own problem, is your own fault. Most parents don't speak to their children about their periods. They just think it's something that should be kept secret and they feel uncomfortable about it, shy and embarrassed about it. Girls tend to miss school when they have their menstruation because they cannot handle it. This affects the success of their studies hugely because on those particular days they miss tasks, they miss information, they miss teaching time. During the educational sessions, I have learned that puberty is the changes in your body, the skin, hair and even your emotions. I think that always keeping girls in school, it's a great thing. It has taught us so many things. It has shown us the way. Small towns like Falvater have got a very serious challenge in terms of getting information. And without Procter & Gamble, we would not be able as a department to reach out to all the kids in the province. And this is a major breakthrough for, for the Department of Education. Because of the family background, they would not have sanitary towels. So now that they have them, their ego is raised, their potential is also, they, they, they look like the other kids who are not from farms. So the self-confidence in them is also enhanced. Girls tend to be more relaxed, more accepting of menstruation, and even when they see an always nurse walks in the school, like uh, in the lower classes, they're in a hurry to get to grade six so they can speak to you and ask you about it. And then I find that they also know better. They're, they're well informed as compared to um, some years back when I started working. They do know what's gonna happen to them. Knowing or understanding the changes in their bodies, and then what they must do and what they must not do to when they had periods. And then the other thing is hygiene. We start educating the girls from the age of 10, especially when we do life skills in the classroom. The problem that used to cause them to stay away from schools that they don't have pets to help them. So the thing that they use, they are so shameful to come to school putting them on. I feel more confident because I learned about changes and, and menstruation is not a disease.
What I've learned today from the nurse session is that I now know how to look at the calendar and know when my menstruation is coming so that I can put the pad in my bag. Do not stay at home because school is very important. If we get a request to say, do allow the boys, uh, we will. And the reason is simple. Research shows that one of the key issues which makes the girls to stay away from school is bullying. When you include the boys, they get to understand what actually happens. But they are also more sympathetic to understand that this is a serious issue, it's not a laughing issue. If we have road shoes on the program to parents, I think it will help. Because it can be it can be a one man show. It can be only the department. We also need the community to be involved in this, so that uh, there is paradigm shift on their part. I would want them to have more responsibility in terms of co-parenting, but also co-educating. I would rather take away from my parents than anyone else. And if parents will start the education at home, it will probably make our life easier that by the time you go to the school, that we are actually speaking the same language. I would say to parents, be your daughter's friend. Um, talk to your daughter long before they even start so that you develop that bond. And then when periods come, talk to your daughter about it. Don't be afraid, don't be cagey about it, it's, it's normal. Admit that you also go through it and give her some tips how to go about it and give her support, as much support as possible, because they need that. So one of the main results, obviously, is to make sure that girls actually attend school. So we look at school attendance levels, um, and that's the main metric of whether the program is successful or not. And a secondary result that we didn't expect in the beginning is that you actually find a drop in teenage pregnancy rates in the schools where the program is implemented because now suddenly girls understand what is happening to their bodies and they're more confident as well and so you find that they take more responsible decisions for themselves. A pilot study for the campaign in the Eastern Cape noted that school attendance of girls had increased from around 70 to 92 percent. Definitive school dropout by girls and teenage pregnancies had also both been reduced by half. But then there's also the motivation that we give the girls and the access to educational resources that we give them, like career guidance. And for me, the best thing about this program is when you actually find a girl that never realised that she could have a dream for herself and suddenly you're opening a world to her where she actually believes that she has a future and that she has an important role to play in making that happen. Education in, in Africa is, is still, still a challenge and I think um, what we have seen though are quite a few success stories and one of the key success stories is in the enrolment rates. For example, Tanzania has been able to enroll an extra three million children over the last five years, which is incredible. But on the other hand, uh, we have what's uh, coined twin crisis. There's still many children who are not enrolled in school across Africa. Indeed, 30 million children are still out of school. So we have an enrolment challenge, but we also have a quality of education challenge. And um, this certainly has been recognised across a lot of Africa. And many African governments are investing a lot more in education than they did before. Indeed, some governments are investing almost 25% of their budget, the SUTU, for example. And this is in recognition of the fact that education is, is critical and it's key. But there is still a need for more schools, more teachers, more books. But what is really interesting again is this innovation across Africa. And we can see the, the use now of, of mobile phones in classrooms, which will help. It's not the solution, but there is something going on across Africa where you can use these new technologies. And this, this is gonna be fascinating in the next few years. Thank you to all our contributors. Join us next month on Tuesday the 8th of October where we travel across Africa to bring you more on inclusive business. But for now, thanks for watching.